Hello, I'm Blaise Doran. Thank you for choosing to watch this presentation. Normally in a live situation, I would be encouraging you to all be much more interactive, asking me questions and so on. Now, obviously, that's not possible in this situation. But I still want you to keep using your brains. So if you come up with questions as we go along, please jot them down. We should have an opportunity to go through them at a different time. To briefly orient us to the presentation itself, I'm going to introduce myself, where I work, and how the clinic I work in functions. But I'll also introduce some of those ideas I've just been talking about at that point. We'll go through the case study, and then I'll try and talk through the formulation that we may have come up with in a, in a clinical scenario. Then I'll introduce some of the philosophical concepts to try and make sense of that, to help build, if you like, a narrative for rehabilitation. Also, there's some supplementary material which will be available through links uh, along with this video. I'm going to really encourage you to go through at least a couple of them. One is a case study. The supplementary material has much more detail. The reason why is I'm only going to be presenting one possible formulation of the information within that. The more detailed supplementary information is for you to try and come up with your own ideas and perhaps we can use that as a springboard for discussion later. Also, I'm going to be presenting a framework which I'm going to aim to make some kind of sense of the patient journey. That comes from a paper which you should be able to download as well. But there's also a link to a YouTube video of one of the co-authors of that paper discussing the particular framework called the Kenevin framework. I'd hope to do a much deeper dive into this material than I'm going to be able to do today, so perhaps it's more of a toe dip than a deep dive. I'm comfortable with that, and I hope you are too. If I manage to get a couple of you interested in doing this kind of thing, I'd be satisfied. But for the rest of you, this is really to demonstrate that there may be practical applications for philosophical concepts, certainly in clinical scenarios. Thank you. Right, who am I and where do I work? Well, you already know my name is Blaze. I'm a physiotherapist who trained in the UK. You can probably tell from my accent. And I migrated to work in Australia in 2006. I've been here ever since. I won't go into detail about my clinical experience or my qualifications. I've just written them up there for you to know that apparently I have some expertise in this area. I work at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne called the Children's Pain Management Clinic. The clinic itself runs on the suggested model from the International Association for the Study of Pain for Multidisciplinary Pain Centres. Bearing in mind that clinically all of us work part-time, we have two pain specialists, both of whom are consultant anaesthetists or anesthesiologists as you call them in the US. We have a doctor who's training in pain medicine, the pain fellow. We have a child and adolescent psychiatrist, three psychologists, two physiotherapists, of which I'm obviously one, and two occupational therapists. I wanted to tell you briefly how the clinic works. So this is a publicly funded clinic, which means there is no fee to pay. It is free at the point of delivery, no copay whatsoever. It's open to any child in the state of Victoria, and in fact, some of the border regions around the other states as well. The mainstay of the clinic is a multidisciplinary assessment. We hold two of those a week. And how that works is they'll come and see the doctor for an hour. Then they'll go and see the psychiatrist and psychologist for an hour. They work concurrently. The psychiatrist sees the parent. The child goes to see the psychologist. After that, they come and see the occupational therapist and physiotherapist for an hour. And then they finally get a break. And that's when we put our heads together and formulate all of the assessment findings. After that, for up to an hour, they come back to see the doctors, usually only the doctors, who will provide some feedback, our formulation, and any plan of care. Well, what am I going to be talking about? Obviously, it's going to be around persisting pain. However, when I think about persisting pain across the lifespan, there are a number of things that seem to defy analysis or defy explanation or defy description. People way more erudite than I am have managed to discuss this. I'll give you the example of Quintner and others talking about the aporia of pain, the indescribable puzzle of pain. I'm not suggesting that philosophy is going to provide some kind of magical explanation or solution for that puzzle. What I am suggesting, though, is that we can use 
philosophical frameworks and viewpoints, philosophical concepts, to act as a kind of probe and in a way enlighten us as to some of the patterns that may feed into a pain experience. So if we extend that and start to think about persisting pain in youth, then I'm proposing that there are dynamic elements within that pain experience that go beyond just the physical. And I'm going to be cheeky. And I'm going to be using a philosophical term, metaphysical. Now, metaphysical is a very contentious word to define in philosophy. But in this instance, I'm going to be quite literal. That there is something beyond the physical, both in the corporeal sense, but also in what can be seen and can be described, that make up an individual's pain experience. This may be blindingly obvious to some of you, but I'm not going to make an assumption that it is. Now, related to metaphysics, again, somewhat contentiously, because uh, it depends on your philosophical viewpoint, um, but related to metaphysics is ontology. The ontology being the study of the nature of being in existence, or sometimes termed as the study of what there is. I think um, we have to probably consider an ontological viewpoint in an individual's pain experience. Of course, then, that potentially brings up conversations to be had about self and what is self and how does self evolve. And related again to that concept is the philosophical idea of immunity. It's a play on the physical immunity idea. So I suppose it's a you could, in a lay way, describe it as a metaphysical immune system, the thought-based idea of what is self and what is not self. So finally, one might relate to that as well, what one chooses to assimilate, what one allows in versus what one rejects. So when it comes to it from a philosophical stance, I'm going to be talking almost exclusively about some of the work of a German philosopher called Peter Sloterdijk. It's a good question. What has philosophy got to do with it? Many moons ago, I was part of an online discussion board and one of the fellow members made a comment when some of us were discussing philosophical ways of viewing problems relating to individuals' pain experiences. And the comment was, I'm paraphrasing, are we in danger of our wheels spinning while sounding smart? I think the answer is probably yes, if it's purely the equivalent of mental onanism. I think the major obstacle to overcome is finding ways to actually apply these philosophical perspectives to real-world experiences so they don't just live in thought experiments. And here's a gentle reminder. The scientific method, which is highly regarded and deeply ingrained in most of our professions, is essentially a practical application of a philosophical viewpoint of logical positivism. I'm pretty sure we're going to discover today from one or more of our speakers that when you're working with people experiencing persisting pain, it requires that you have some interest in the contradictions and paradoxes that make up the human condition. And so we need to go beyond the legitimate best practice models and brave the vortex of complexity and uncertainty. I'm suggesting that philosophy may provide us with some of the critical skills to do just that. Okay, a very quick pause to remind you that there are links to download uh, supplemental information from. One is a YouTube link which explains the Kinevin framework and also the paper from which it comes. Following that, we'll start on the case study. I really would like you to try and download the case study because it's got much more detail than I am going to present in this one. And I'm only going to present one of the possible formulations that can come out of all that information. What I'm going to encourage you to do is have a look at the detailed information and maybe that can start as a springboard for discussion a little later when we have an opportunity to talk about it. If you're one of these people who's handy with a smartphone, you can scan the QR code, it'll come up on the slide, and that'll take you directly to the YouTube video on your smartphone.
I'd really like you to have had a go at looking at the extended version of the case study and all that information that was gathered from this uh, made-up multidisciplinary assessment. It is a made-up case. It might be an amalgam of many people that I might have seen over the last seven years. But there's no issue with confidentiality. I've made up a name for her. This is Taylor. She's a 16-year-old girl with a five-year history of chronic daily headache. Well, as you might expect, she goes to see her family doctor for her headache problems. Taylor gives some vague descriptors about how the headache behaves, and so the family doctor is unsure as to whether or not it's true migraine, but thought, given her mother and her grandmother both had migraines, that it was appropriate to refer to a neurologist. But the neurologist does a pretty comprehensive workup, including an optic fundus examination, which he's not particularly happy with, and he has a suspicion of some papilledema around the optic disc. She's sent for a lumbar puncture. The lumbar puncture is a high end of normal opening pressure and erring on the side of caution he treats her as if she has idiopathic intracranial hypertension but the headache doesn't seem to respond to the usual therapy for that yeah. that gets ceased he did a reassessment of the lumbar puncture and the optic disc examination the lumbar puncture was a normal opening pressure and the optic disc hadn't really changed so he changed his diagnosis to pseudopapilledema but because the headaches persist, he also trials over a two-year period a number of headache-based medications. Mm. None of those had a great deal of success. And it's at that point she gets referred to us at the Children's Pain Management Clinic. Well, the medical assessment didn't reveal much more than was already in the referral from the neurologist. They did point out a couple of things that probably explain perhaps the family model for treatment which was essentially a cure-seeking model and very biomedically focused, wanting to know a diagnosis, wanting to have medication. There was some confusion over why the neurologist might have changed his diagnosis from one thing to another, and this caused some consternation amongst the family at the time. The most notable thing as far as the medical team were concerned was that the exacerbation of headaches seemed to coincide with some of the wider societal events going on at the time, such as the COVID-19 restrictions and lockdowns that have been occurring in Melbourne. The psychiatrist managed to find out some very pertinent information about the family. Firstly, Angela, the mother, works in a school part-time, not only has problems with uh, migraine, but did in the past at least have problems with back pain for which she received a microdiscectomy and a uh, laminectomy. Marco, the father, hasn't been home since March 2020. The story behind that is, is he's a fly-in, fly-out worker and he works in the mines in Western Australia as a diesel mechanic. His contract means that he works two weeks on and one week off. But he hasn't been able to come back to Victoria in Australia because if he flies back to Victoria, then he has to quarantine when he goes back to Western Australia. And that would mean he would break his contract and he couldn't afford to do that. Another thing that was revealed was that Luke, Taylor's younger brother, sits on the autistic spectrum. And while his needs are not necessarily significant in comparison to other people on the autistic spectrum, he's undergoing further assessment so that he can claim some money through a national disability scheme. The problem with that is that they're having to do it all privately and that is causing some financial stress. On top of that, the impression that the psychiatrist has was that the responses from the mother were a little flat possibly to the point of being alexithymic, not having the ability to uh, put words to emotional states. He did realize that obviously the amount of stress that she was under may have something to do with that. And it was revealed that there had been quite a lot of marital stress since uh, Marco had been away. It had preceded that as well because the fly in fly out life is quite difficult on families already. Angela insists that the kids don't know. That's an interesting one. We often find that that's not actually the case. While they may not know the specifics, 
they certainly know that their parents' relationship is not the same as it has been before and it does have some kind of emotional impact on them. In relation to uh, Luke and Taylor, there is some uh, sibling conflict going on. Uh, Mum puts this down to Taylor just being a bit jealous of the lack of attention that she's getting in comparison to Luke. Not only was Taylor happy to uh, separate from her mum, but she was also extremely open in her disclosure with the psychologist. Consequently, we got some very good information from Taylor in relation to her current emotional states. And she had quite a number of things that she was worried about. In particular, the situation with her father that we'd already just learned about from the psychiatrist. But also, uh, there's a number of things. She has uh, quite a feeling of loss about not being able to play soccer. First of all, this had been an imposition of um, COVID-19 restrictions. We weren't allowed to play soccer. But when she got back to it, she found that trying to play and trying to run exacerbated her headache. There are a few other things in relation to social anxiety and performance anxiety uh, in terms of academic performance. And also, she admitted to having some kind of conflict problems with her brother. She perceives that her mum really hasn't got a good handle on what's going on for her. And consequently, she finds that from her side of things, that her brother Luke gets all the attention. The psychologist identified a few perpetuating factors. Uh, certainly her father being away and the uncertain return date was one of them. Uh, her social anxieties uh, in relation to school and certain uh, tricky relationships at school. COVID-19 also came up, but also there's a sense of um, some attachment issues perhaps in relation to mum and what's going on with Luke, but also in relation to her absent father who hasn't returned from his fly-in, fly-out work since March. Now, the occupational therapy assessment was also revealing in certain ways. It was fairly obvious that uh, Taylor is a kind of person who thrives off routines and her current routines were in disorder and this included a certain amount of the fact that her father would normally come home at certain times and and hasn't been for a long time but it was also related to the fact that her sleep is now a little bit uh, awry so she has a sleep onset problem up to two hours some of it's related to worries and some of it's related to sleep hygiene issues like being on her phone for an hour before she tries to go to sleep Beyond that, she has some issues with academic performance, which are long-standing, such as mathematics, which is her, as far as she's concerned, the subject she hates. She's had some intervention with external tutors for that, but it seems to have made no difference. She persists, but she finds that it's heavy going and she can't wait to drop it as a subject. One of the major things uh, has already been mentioned by the psychologist, which was the, the loss of a valued activity, which is soccer. And part of it is as far as the occupational therapist is concerned, was was uh, bound up with her relationship with her dad as well, and um, how her dad would take her to soccer and so on and so forth, particularly when he was home. So finally, the occupational therapist also flagged up that there may be issues of self-regulation. In other words, it might be uh, expected that a 16-year-old may be able to settle herself down when, uh, to a certain extent when she was getting worried or agitated or angry or frustrated. In this instance, it's clear to the occupational therapist at least that she's trying to co-regulate with her mother. But of course, her mother doesn't have the resources to co-regulate at the moment and therefore it's setting up a certain amount of conflict. The hallmark of the physiotherapy assessment was that uh, there were many positive things. One being that she was still quite athletic, quite strong, a good range of motion. There didn't seem to be any problem with her balance, nor her coordination. There were a couple of things um, that were, were of note. One was that uh, the back pain that she'd been complaining of since January uh, in 2020 
may or may not be related to a neural dynamic problem. Certainly, it could be elicited when uh, neural dynamic testing was done. However, there was no indication uh, that the headache had a neuromusculoskeletal origin. I'm in the habit uh, in my physiotherapy assessments of observing movement throughout the whole interview. And what was fairly clear was that there was a lot of uh, motor overflow when she became uncomfortable with certain lines of questioning. It wasn't just about the fidgeting, it was also a little bit about the look of rabbits in the headlight. Am I going to be giving the right answer? And her facial expressions did give her away from time to time. This doesn't necessarily mean anything, but it, it's helpful to build up part of the story in my mind. The other interesting thing to note is I always wonder why, why people bite their nails. Not because I've never bitten my nails, but I wonder what that's about. Is there an anxiety substrate to it? Oh, thank goodness. We made it to the end. <laughs> I often feel that that's how our patients feel at the end of our assessment process. We do think it's worth it because it is one of those things where we can gather a vast amount of information and quite quickly put it together in order to be able to try and find at least the start of a journey for rehabilitation. So let's formulate. My apologies for zipping around the screen a little bit. I'm having to make a little bit of space over there in order to explain how I'm going to be uh, talking through the Kinevin framework. Now, hopefully you've had a chance to go to the link, have a look at the YouTube video of Dave Stone explaining how the Kinevin model works. Uh, you might have even been good and read the paper. However, I'm going to make a couple of assumptions, and I think one or two of them are reasonable. If we think about Taylor's healthcare journey, she may have started in the disorder space. In other words, not really knowing which is the best kind of decision-making space she needs to be in, and so defaulting to what you would normally uh, do. In this case, because of the family model, go and see a doctor. So she goes to see the family doctor. The family doctor has to sit in a space where um, a lot of things are pro protocol-driven. And that's, well, if, if you're anything like a, um, a family doctor in Australia, it gets about six minutes per consult. A lot of it's got to be based on uh, protocols and, and sensing and categorizing and then acting. So in this instance that's exactly what she did. Couldn't really fit it into a, a clear picture of migraine so therefore refers to a neurologist but also gives them well-trodden advice on how to try and abort a migraine like headache. Of course the neurologist sits in the complicated space, the expert. The expert will do a lot of analysis and try and evaluate what are the cause-effect relationships. He thinks he has, and quite reasonably, uh, errs on the side of caution, just in case it is intracranial hypertension, um, and treats her for that. However, she doesn't respond well to it in terms of the treatment, so he has to rethink and does further tests, further analysis, finds out the cause and effect relationship isn't quite as obvious as he thought before, so probably drops back into what would be a more uh, known type space and makes decisions about, about prescribing medication and uh, having an evaluation of how that uh, affects her and eventually has to say, well, go back to using simple analgesia and I'll refer you to a specialist team for an evaluation of your pain. Now, I'm not saying that the Children's Pain Management Clinic uh, doesn't do either of those things. We do. That's very much part of our process. I think the difference, though, is that when we get to a multidisciplinary assessment, what we're doing, in a way, is probing. We're having a look and seeing what are the potential patterns here. Not all of them will be right. There may be associations that we have made in our minds that really don't affect the person. The point is to start off probing, see what you can elucidate, try and see what those patterns are and what emerges from them. I should make a, a comment about the potential for Taylor to have fallen into the chaos pit, um, and that is if she'd have kept going back uh, to seeing her, either her GP or a neurologist and expecting the same result from 
uh, another medication and so on and so forth, uh, falling back on patterns of behavior, it very likely she would have fallen off the edge of that cliff and fallen into chaos. Now, obviously it's worth trying to formulate this from what I think is currently the most popular way of doing so, uh, framing it from a biological, psychological and social point of view. From a biological perspective, she'd been through a diagnostic process, although the family didn't necessarily perceive that to be particularly successful, and neither were the trials of medications. I think that's a little difficult for this family, uh, because as we'll see over in the in the border areas between social and uh, biological. It seems to be from the family history of migraines that this is the model that ought to work. You need to go and see the doctor, you get a diagnosis, you get some medication and you manage it that way. However, from a low back pain point of view, there's still some things to look at to see whether or not she'll respond to treatment from a, an adverse neural dynamic perspective. The things that really are interesting in this one is that there is a great deal of uh, social influence perhaps on the pain exacerbations because we don't think it's a coincidence that these exacerbations occurred around the times of the major lockdowns in Melbourne. So that societal angst will have rubbed off on uh, all of our adolescents in, at that time. COVID-19 restrictions also led to a loss of routine and structure both from a school point of view, a home point of view, and from a sporting point of view for Taylor. So she couldn't play soccer like she used to be able to. Now, all those things, you know, school and sport, uh, have a certain tribal element to them. In other words, uh, losing your tribal connections, face-to-face -face tribal connections at least, are important, particularly to adolescents when they are starting to individuate. This would have had a, a, an impact on her self-regulation strategies. Where her chosen one was to be able to um, play sport and that was a way of managing her stress. If you were going to take a purely psychological viewpoint on this, then obviously there are a number of uh, anxiety drivers, like her father being away, her social anxiety for the certain elements of school and tricky relationships there, but also her academic and sporting performance. There's an interesting thing about her trying to seek co-regulation from her mother, and we have you know, some idea that what tends to happen when people are in crisis and certainly experiencing persisting pain is that they behaviorally regress. They seem to go backwards in a developmental stage. And so seeking co-regulation is, is a reasonable thing to occur, but the problem is that there's a certain degree of sibling conflict involved, a certain degree of attachment uh, in relation to the mother and the father, and also we have to consider that there's um, depletion of mum's resources. Mum is, as we would say in Australia, doing it tough. She's having to get a, a young child assessed for autism needs. Got another child who has persisting pain problems. Her husband's been away for most of the year and she's feeling some financial stress as well. Obviously, there's also the parental relationship and even though uh, Angela decides that the kids don't really know about it, uh, as I've already mentioned, it's very unlikely for, even if they don't know the details, it, it certainly will be affecting them. The other thing to consider is that um, they did come away feeling dumped by the, the neurologist, uh, as they put it, you know, we've been put in the too hard basket. One might say that these could be physical manifestations of Taylor's distress, but there's care needed to be had here, just in case that that gets misinterpreted, um, as being all in her head. This is one of the problems I think with the biopsychosocial model is we tend to silo the information even if the information is not coming from a siloed source. So this is really much more for our convenience. Is it satisfactory? Not every single time. I think there might be a better way of co-constructing with the individual. What is it that needs rebuilding in order to restore her confidence in life? And that may be the source of why she's in pain, but it also may mean her roadmap out of there. And that is exactly why I'm talking about some of the philosophical concepts that may help us to be able to do that. Well, how can we put this together in a way that rather than 
unconsciously separates, consciously synthesizes, and does so in a way that doesn't become too formulaic. Now, I think this is important at least to try and do. We're dealing with the complex space, the, if we go back to the Kinethin framework. The complex spaces from where emergent phenomena arise. And if you remember, formulaic methods, which are fundamentally reductionist, are probably not going to work particularly well in this space. I mean, they are convenient, and, they, um, and there are certain people for whom they appeal to, certainly the people who hold the purse. But they can, if uh, used to the letter, be rather inflexible sometimes. We know that there's a current trend in the pain field for conceptualizing pain as being you know, uh, about credible reasons, you know, a belief that there's an imbalance between your safety and your danger. So well, I'm not criticizing the protectometer idea at all. I think it's a good one. It's handy. Uh, it's a great reflective tool. It's interactive. It, the seven domains don't just focus on uh, the, the bodily or the physical experience. There are some things I get itchy about, which is, I, I suppose, a personal thing. One is that not just the Aussie in-joke about dim sims, which um, we can talk about when it gets to the discussion period. But um, I think it's because of the use of me. It's rather internally focused, even though some of the domains are clearly not just focused on the me experience. They're about interactions and um, environments. So personally, I riff on the idea a little bit. I, I prefer to encapsulate it somehow in a question of, of why does the individual feel imperiled? More on this concept a little bit later, but because finally I'm going to get to, as I promised, Peter Sloterdijk. Sloterdijk and some of his concepts and ideas. So Sloterdijk is a German philosopher and cultural theorist. He was born in the late 40s in Germany, he's still alive. I think he's still even working uh, in a, a university in, in Germany. And I find his work quite difficult to categorize, and maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. I think for one thing you might uh, get a handle on is he extends some of the existential phenomenological German school of philosophy, so Heidegger and so on. And there are some who label his work as post-humanist. I've, I've got a very tenuous grasp on what they actually mean by that. I, I haven't really got time to go into it, uh, and particularly on this video, but um, I take it to mean something that these ideas uh, around uh, the nature of existence and being doesn't just focus around the human experience all the time, so it goes uh, beyond the anthropocentric, if you like. So what is considered his um, magnum opus, his major work, is the Severe's Trilogy. Now, those of you who have been paying attention, and you'll see that there's some imagery peppered throughout the presentation with bubbles and so on and so forth. Well, this is what it's about. So the trilogy is um, three separate volumes. They can be read separately, um, but they are uh, taken as a philosophy to, to be read together as a, a bunch of ideas. So it's bubbles, globes, and foams. And what I'm going to do in the next few slides is select some of those ideas and the ideas I believe to be relevant to the work that we do. Now I apologize if I'm appearing to rush through this, but I'm going to suggest you can stop and rewind the video if you're not quite understanding what I'm saying, go through it again and try and build up a picture in your own mind of what I'm talking about. Now these are interpretations, I have to add, of Sloterdijk's work. They are necessarily what he intended, but I certainly think that they um, have a reflection uh, of the underlying principles of what he's talking about. So bubbles, what is that all about? I'm going to start with relating it to the concept of self. And when we're, you know, in our early development, the concept of self is not necessarily strong. It's a quite a small one. We always see that um, our sense of self is always in relation to others. And that comes from, uh, according to Sloterdijk, even uh, further back than that, uh, prenatally in, in the womb, that we're in um, this kind of dyadic form of bubble where we are uh, in the amniotic sac within the womb of our mothers. So 
That's an important point because some of the things that he contends is that, that you know, that we are in life are, are trying to essentially recreate that utopian ideal of being back in the womb. However, we won't go back too far into that and won't get too psychoanalytical. But talking of psychoanalytical, you know, there's this idea that um, perhaps what we are trying to do with this bubble, this metaphysical sphere that we create for ourselves is that we are trying to create some kind of immune barrier w against what would be the, the, the real things about the, the animal side of human beings. So, you know, we all have a need to eat, excrete and, you know, eventually reproduce. Um, if we go back to psychoanalysis, not that I know very much about it, but, you know, Lacanian concept of what is real, so the irreducible uh, aspects of, of humanity. These concepts then are, is where you can see a similarity with, with um, the physical immune system. The, the idea that what we try and do is inoculate ourselves against the things that uh, are to us perhaps threatening. And also the idea of self versus non-self. Now where do we get our original immunity? We get it from our mother and um, in this instance that would be the same thing. So we intake on ideas from our primary caregivers. So in this instance, obviously, it's going to be parents. And uh, if you're skeptical about that, then when you do have children, it's amazing when you open your mouth and you hear your mother or your father or both come out. And where has that come from, even though you're a fully individuated adult? Moving on from that, I think the idea is that the self as a concept then can is somehow permeable or semi-permeable in, in the, that it can imbibe or assimilate things and uh, as a corollary to that, re reject them as well. So in a way, what you take in, and remember the bubble is composed of a minimum unit of two, um, whatever you're interacting with, the other, other party is what that you're interacting with. So self is always in reference uh, down the track, even from when you are an infant, always in reference to something else, to another. The reality is, is what you take on and you keep is really more about what you can form a symbiotic relationship with. It is something that therefore has a hallmark of change. There's lots of change going on within it. But the most threatening change, obviously, is when that bubble is, is ruptured. And that does happen. And you could probably think about many times in your life where a bubble ruptured and you were in crisis. Why are you in crisis? Because now you are exposed to, if you like, all the things that are real that you'd formed some kind of immune barrier against. That doesn't mean it can't be reformed. It, in fact, must be reformed fairly quickly. But you remain in crisis and remain imperiled until that happens. I don't know whether you have had an experience where you find an image and you go, ooh, me likey. Well, this is one of them. In seriousness, the concept of the rupturing of the bubble may be an important one in this case. And in fact, we might be able to frame it as this being the cause of the existential crisis. And with that existential crisis, the experience of pain. Moving on from that, though, I mean, Taylor's construction of self may involve a number of things that we know are interacting in this case. We know that she has a strong relationship with her father, and there may be a, a, a an element of instability being introduced there, the fact that he has not been home for such an extended period of time where she would rely on the routine of him coming back every couple of weeks or so and being around at home for a week. There's also the fact that her father was instrumental in getting her involved in soccer. It's a bond of sorts that is between that dyad. And therefore there might be a sense of, you know, when your father's not there, is the world safe? But then. We cannot dismiss the fact that she does have a strong relationship with her mother. Perhaps that's the, the substrates for her responding so badly towards how her mother is paying, in her opinion, paying more attention to her brother. Again, that's a, a something of stability. If you're, if you're reliant at certain stages in your uh, daily life of co-regulating with somebody, then the absence of that is going to also introduce a degree of instability. So if we talk about the brother, then the brother may introduce all sorts of internal conflicts we don't know, but we can start to probe this one um, about whether or not she's a bit conflicted about how she feels. Um, maybe she is actually genuinely concerned, 
but then also feels as though he's taking away the attention. There may be also an element of, you know, is my brother friend or foe? Well, he's family, but is he friend or foe? Going beyond that, the use of physical activity, uh, something obviously that's a, a valued part of the family structure, or at least the, the, between the dyad of the, the daughter and the father, and she uses it as a, a regulation strategy. You, you take that away, instability is, is introduced again. And then slightly wider than that, the relationships acts external to the family, such as the squad, uh, the tribe of the squad uh, playing soccer, and also the relationships you might have outside of the family at school with friends and so on. And we can potentially move a little bit further out than just the sphere. When Slotertijk talks about globes and he's talking about the, well, basing it on things like this is what humanity does to immunize itself against things that are potentially threatening. So, for example, the idea of the firmament from biblical cosmology or from the idea of ecumene, the broader identity. You can have a worldwide ecumene. We all belong to the same group of people. And in this instance, we might bring soccer back in again. You know, I am the member of a soccer team. Uh, we are in a league. That league was in Melbourne. Melbourne is in Victoria. Victoria is in Australia. Australia is in the Southern Hemisphere. The Southern Hemisphere is part of the world, etc. So these ideas of globalizing things a little bit, so it attaches some more of the kind of the conceptual ideas about who we are, and what we belong to, and what is part of our way of forming immunity against the things that we think are going to be attacking us. I suppose the questions you could ask in this instance then are, how do you feel safe when your, as Hamlet puts it, brave or hanging firmament is crumbling? Within that, there's the whole point that uh, Melbourne, as a city, had to isolate, had to isolate from the rest of Victoria, and then has to isolate from the rest of the nation. You know, why, why Melbourne? Why us? Another destabilizing factor is that loss of identity. When am I going to be with my squad again? If you're thinking about it from a 16-year-old, somebody who's just beginning to individuate and, and make sense of life, things that change very quickly during the adolescent period, there are a lot of things that are confusing. And introducing these kinds of levels of uh, destabilizing energy what might your response be when you've only got 16 years worth of life experience? So this doesn't negate any of the findings necessarily. All these things are completely relevant and in the same way as you might look at the biopsychosocial assessment, it doesn't negate any of those things that we've just talked about. But what I'm hoping it illustrates to you is this, this becomes more of a, a containment vessel, if you like, its own sphere. So that was a bit of a whistle-stop tour through some of the ideas from Sloterdijk. I'm going to end with how can we conclude whether or not this is useful? What does this afford us? Well, the first thing I'm saying, I don't think it subtracts from what's already there. It's, it, it acts, as I've said before, as a, like a containment vessel, like a sphere in its own right, to be able to maintain some of the ideas that you've taken from everybody's assessments and keep them there in your mind as you go through the rehabilitation journey with the, the person who's come to see you. And in a way, it, it assists in, I think, uh, narrative journey mapping. Why narrative? Well, if we go back to the Knevin model, it's suggested that, that if you're probing to illuminate, narrative may be one of the ways in which you can do that. So um, it's sometimes fun. I, I have done it before, not very often, uh, to do the kind of hero with a thousand faces way of co-constructing a narrative. In other words, working with them to say, how do you want to write your own story from here? And in some ways, it's a way of being able to monitor the effects of intervention, not from an outcome measure sense necessarily, but when you're dealing with a complex system and you know that you change one factor, what's going to happen? You're looking to see whether or not this changes the other factors or does it change the pattern dynamics? As a way of being able to hold that in your mind while you treat, I think this is one particular way in which one might be able to do it. I'll let you know, as I say thank you for watching this presentation, that any of the bibliography and references that might be scattered through this presentation will be in the download links.